أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبو القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, thank you for joining us once more on Vishu Show, Back to the Basics, in which we discuss the basic contentions and disputes between ourselves and other sects. Of course, we have been looking at, over the past few weeks, several principles in our dialogues with others. And of course, I'm just going to ask the Shabab who are working in the control room to turn off the echo. Um, sorry about that, dear viewers, just a slight technical issue. But we have been discussing the issues of contentions between ourselves and other groups who happen to affiliate themselves with other opinions and views and disagree with us fundamentally on what we believe. Even if those disagreements are less than others. So throughout these past few weeks, what we've been trying to analyze or put forward rather is a principal set of rules of engagement which are not only consistent with the worldview and aqidah which we believe in, but more importantly are also fundamentally valuable in reaching a conclusion or a sound ground in order to have a fruitful discussion with others. Throughout the past few weeks we've put forward this concept of the worldview, an interconnected set of beliefs and how these worldviews revolve around bigger questions. In the past few episodes of last week, we introduced how this allows us to move forward by putting forward the question of whether or not a deity exists. And as opposed to analyzing each question individually, what we've chosen to do is analyze each view as a distinct worldview. That is to say, we would analyze atheism and its consequences, its necessary consequences as a result of disbelief in God. Then we would analyze, for example, other worldviews respectively. But we have begun with the worldview of atheism and that is indeed what we will be continuing with. And what we've been trying to do throughout these episodes is apply the principle given to us by the holy Imams, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all, known as Qa'idat al-Ilzam, namely the principle of compelling others to hold on to the very principles which they would normally claim they compel themselves to. In Western logic, this is known as, to a certain degree, reductio ad absurdum. That is to take a principle and basically move forward with that principle till we see the necessary consequences of what holding on to that principle would do to a person's set of beliefs. And it's been quite an interesting experience. Of course, I've tried my best not to misrepresent any other view, and I try my best to source and cite the statements of those who would attribute themselves to a certain ideological school or philosophical view. I try not to misrepresent what has been said by such schools, but of course, sometimes we can talk about the necessary ramifications and consequences of what they're saying. There is no problem in doing that as long as our judgment and our observation is always based upon rationality and the rational consequences of what is being said. For those of you who were not able to tune in last week and for those of you who of course have endured this short break of one day in which we did not talk about such an issue, allow me to remind you we had reached the worldview of atheism and we had spoken about how atheism is not merely the abstract rejection of a deity, but rather the entire worldview and package which comes alongside rejecting a deity. Of course, there's several things we want to say when it comes down to looking at a worldview. When it comes to the worldview that atheism normally propounds, now there are exceptions to the rule, but we are talking about the general large mass population of atheism. They would believe in what we call today materialism. And materialism is the view that everything is ultimately material in nature. At the most fundamental level, everything that exists outside consists of nothing but matter and energy. 
Everything is governed by the basic laws of physics and in principle can be explained in terms of those physical laws. So when we look at materialism, any explanation it provides would be a physical explanation and no other form of explanation. Every object is a purely physical object and every event that occurs has a purely physical cause. That is to say it is caused by another physical event and is not based upon choice, for example. If it has any cause at all, in short, the universe is just a collection of clumps of matter following the laws of physics. So that is the world view. But what is its account or methodology of understanding this? What is its basic source or epistemology? If materialism is what we would describe as the ontology, what is the epistemology or the source of knowledge of atheism? Essentially, the source of knowledge would be what we call scientific naturalism. That would be the name of the general worldview. Or strict naturalism, and that is the view that spatial-temporal that spatio-temporal universe of entities postulated by our best or current sciences, particularly physics, is all there is. So everything has literally a physical scientific explanation. This might be rejected or might be contested by some of our friends who happen to be atheists and they may very well come forward and say, look, at the end of the day, that's not what I believe. I just believe that there's no God, but I'm open for other solutions. As we've said, denying a major concept such as God has several consequences. And this is something which must be recognized ultimately. It's not fair that we enter into a conversation and postulate a massive claim without being able to postulate some of the answers to dilemmas raised by that claim. Allow me to give a very brief example just so the believer understands exactly what I'm saying, God willing. If we as believers claim to believe in a God who is all-knowing, all-powerful and has created this universe, then to a certain degree we are expected to have a decent response to the existence of evil and suffering within the universe. This is a classical dilemma against theism which is raised by those who do not believe in a deity. And it's from the right to ask such a question because they can see what they would call an apparent conflict between the existence of suffering and the existence of a God who knows everything and is all-powerful. And of course, we will come to that particular discussion, inshallah ta'ala. It's not like the school of the Ahlul Bayt, may for peace and blessings of Allah be upon them, struggles to provide an answer for that. But the point is, that is a decent question which arises as a result of a non-believer knowing that a believer believes in the concept of a deity. Therefore, when a person claims to you that they do not believe in a deity, it likewise has several consequences. And it's not fair that people who belong to the other side of the fence just sit back and poke holes at one side of the fence, but refuse to engage with questions about their own. If someone does refuse to engage with such questions at such a fundamental level, then we have to just say that they're not very serious about the bigger questions in life and they're not very serious about that which they take seriously as fundamental, fundamental parts of that package which we call their worldview. They're not very serious about their philosophy in life, nor have they seriously fought over the big and major questions. So let's go one more time to see what has been said by a very prominent atheist philosopher, a man who by no means is unqualified to talk about the ramifications, consequences and necessary results of denying a belief in God and adopting scientism or naturalism as their worldview. He states, and this is, of course, Professor Alex Rosenberg in his book, The Atheist's Guide to Reality. He states, 
There is much more to atheism than its knockdown arguments that there is no God. So let's get it out of our heads once and for all that atheism is just arguing that God does not exist. Atheism is much more than that and has to postulate some solutions to its own claims and its own worldview as well. There is the whole rest of the worldview, that word that I've been using all along, that comes along with atheism. It's a demanding, rigorous, breathtaking grip on reality, one that has been vindicated beyond reasonable doubt. It's called science. Just to clarify, according to someone like Dr. Alex Rosenberg, atheism is merely the natural consequence of accepting the findings and conclusions and theories. Theories, of course, used here in a scientific manner and not used in the general English usage of a word that we would postulate in philosophy, for example. It, according to Rosenberg, we should take these findings, theories and conclusions and essentially this is what would lead us to atheism and this is what would give us the sufficient grounds for believing that there's no God. Now what's interesting about Rosenberg's worldview here is just how much he's quite willing to concede. He's quite willing to acknowledge everything and that's one thing I like about the works of Alex Rosenberg. I know that some might claim that I'm very biased some might claim that I have a skewed interest in misrepresenting the doctrines of atheism. But in reality, what we notice from Rosenberg is that he acknowledges and he concedes a lot of that which has been said and observed by believing philosophers and by believing thinkers about the necessary consequences of denying God's existence and the necessary consequences of both the scientific or scientist worldview in addition to the materialist worldview. In summarizing the big questions, he states, is there a God? No. What is the nature of reality? What physics says it is? What is the purpose of the universe? There is none. What is the meaning of life? There is none. Why am I here? Just dumb luck. Does prayer work? Of course not. Is there a soul? Is it immortal? He responds, are you kidding? Is there a free will? Not a chance. What happens when we die? Everything pretty much goes on as before except us. What is the difference between right and wrong, good and bad? There is no moral difference between them. Why should I be moral? Because it makes you feel better than being immoral. These are the big questions according to Rosenberg and these are the answers provided by the atheist worldview. Inshallah ta'ala dear viewers we're going to go for a very quick break and when we come back we'll continue analyzing this. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear viewers, thank you for bearing patiently with that short break. Before the break, we were discussing the, nas the natural consequences or the answers to the big questions that every worldview is concerned with and the answers which are provided by the worldview known as atheism or scientific materialism. This set of answers has not been provided by just anyone. It's not been provided by myself, it's not been provided by another theistic apologist, it's not been provided by a theistic polemicist, it's not even been provided by someone that has an agenda against atheism, rather they've been provided by a very articulate, very well studied and very qualified professor of the philosophy of science who himself is a professing atheist and believes that these answers are very liberating. He believes that not only should we embrace these answers, but he believes that in doing so, we are being honest to ourselves in addition to just accepting the facts of reality. 
We had stopped off at the question of what is the difference between right and wrong, good and bad, to which he stated there is no moral difference between them. Then he responds why, he asks the question, why should I be moral? His response is interesting. He states, because it makes you feel better than being immoral. Is abortion euthanasia, euthanasia that is to say killing someone off at an earlier age than a natural death because of the fact they happen to be suffering from, say for example, an illness which is very painful, suicide, paying taxes, foreign aid or anything else you don't like, forbidden, permissible or sometimes obligatory? His response, anything goes. What is love and how can I find it? Love is the solution to a strategic interaction problem. Don't look for it, it will find you when you need it. Does history have any meaning or purpose? It's full of sound and fury, but signifies nothing. Does the human past have any lessons for our future? Fewer and fewer if it ever had any to begin with. What one finds admirable about Rosenberg is he's not interested in beating around the bush or glossing over the reality of the worldview he embraces. He calls a spade a spade. He says it as it is. And this is something very admirable because it allows us to have that conversation without attempting to gloss over in order to beautify things or make them sound nicer for the respective audience. But it's far more I guess I, 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 we could say that this is somewhat of a surprise for many of us. For many of us who might never have considered the metaphysical consequences of denying the existence of God, for many of us who have never considered what the consequences of believing that the world around us is only material, these responses may seem as a bit of a shock. and. There are probably those out there who, when they hear these responses, would say, you're taking what he says out of context. And so we're going to unpack what he said slowly, inshallah ta'ala, over the next few episodes and see, number one, is this rational? Number two, is it to a certain degree contradictory? And number three, is it even livable? And these are the major questions we want to ask. We want to apply here Qa'adat al-Ilzam, the principle of compelling Rosenberg and his friends to accept the viewpoints and beliefs they put forward and see just where it gets us. So it's interesting, Rosenberg states in his book that the universe and everything around us is basically reducible to just physical particles. He states, and I quote, the basic things everything is made up of are fermions and bosons. That's it. Now, of course, from the perspective of physics, this is absolutely true. But really, is that, is that how we want to view the universe? Is that how we want to view everything? Let's ask ourselves the question, if that's how we're going to reduce everything, then in reality, we shouldn't be caring or giving any attention to concepts such as human rights, animal rights, issues of the environment, or even issues of just general concern. Because everything at the end of the day is just made up of fermions and bosons. And when everything is just viewed in that way, what makes anything unique? Other than my personal subjective desire to care about something, is there really a reason for why I'm bothered by anything? And this is a question which I don't think Rosenberg really engages with. He states about the nature of causes, something which many of us who have engaged with atheists before would very much be familiar with. He states, the only causes in the universe are physical causes and everything in the universe that has a cause has a physical cause. And he states from this that the physical facts fix all the facts. So if we were to sit down with Alex Rosenberg and ask him, for example, Professor Rosenberg, you wrote a very interesting paper on this topic. 
Is there anything in particular which jotted your curiosity about it? Or is there anything in particular which caused you to wish to go down this route of study? Alex Rosenberg would not invoke, for example, the fact that he's always been interested in X. He would not invoke the fact that he had heard an event which jotted his curiosity about Y. He would not cite the fact that he was inspired to write it by thinking for a long period of time about X. He would say that physical event Y was preceded by physical event X, which was in turn preceded by physical event W, which was in turn preceded by physical event U, or V rather, which was in turn pre preceded by physical event U. And it would go back into a circle of essentially a series of physical events which had a domino effect and inspired Dr. Rosenberg. And this is one of the commitments of the new atheism. It's a commitment to what we would call physicalism, the belief that everything has a physical cause, that essentially there is no mental states involved, but rather only physical states. This is something which has been observed by several prominent commentators in the world of philosophy. They've observed that one of the consequences of the argument put forward by Dr. Alex Rosenberg, or Professor Alex Rosenberg, I wouldn't want to detract from his stature in academia, is that he believes intentionality is but an illusion. Brothers and sisters, what is intentionality? And I'm more than aware that I will be explaining this now, and in future episodes I will have to probably re-explain this again, just so we understand the terminology being utilized. When I talk of intentionality, I'm essentially talking of the human being's ability to conceive of something beyond himself. My brain is a physical clump of matter. But my brain has certain mental states. So for example, I could be thinking right now about Scotland. And I'm not thinking about Scotland as just a set of letters. I could think about Scotland and conceptualize it. But how is a physical object about something else? This table cannot be about Kerbala. Or for example, this chair is not about the person sitting on it. How do we explain away this concept of a physical object being about something else? This aboutness, which is conceived during our thought process, is known as intentionality. In order to explain away the concept of intentionality, Alex Rosenberg uses a genius analogy, according to him, which is the concept of a photograph. He states that a photograph is a physical object which is about something else because a photographer has taken a photo, photo and onto this particular piece of card or paper, he has printed an image of something else. But of course, this analogy and this response to the problem of intentionality doesn't quite do the job. A photograph is clearly just an imposed image and has not thought or being about something other than what the photographer has put onto the card. But inshallah ta'ala, dear viewers, we will explore this concept a bit more during tomorrow's episode. I thank you once more for joining me live from the holy city of Karbala. And I pray that what I have been discussing tonight has not been too difficult to understand. I'm more than aware that a lot of big terminologies have been utilized. But of course, inshallah ta'ala, if you bear with me patiently, we will be breaking them down one by one and we shall understand exactly what is being said. Dear viewers, thank you once more. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.